Th thank you so much. Uh, a few bullet points I want to make. I need your name, please. Uh, Joel Baumgar, State Representative from District 58, in Mississippi Legislature, Mississippi House Representative. What um, 58? District 58 is uh, Ridgeland and Madison between the interstate and uh, reservoir. Thank you. Quite so fast, but she's got to be. All right. I can talk loud. It's slowing down the whole different challenge. Um, so I, I started studying the opioid epidemic about six months ago, and I pulled the entire data set from CDC and every other source trying to figure out what caused it. What is the root cause here? So first, a few highlights. One, Mississippi has a prescriber problem, but until recently did not have an overdose problem. We're in the top five for prescriptions, but the bottom ten for actual overdoses. So, so why is that? Well, the opioid problem has three parts. One is before you're addicted, two is after you're addicted, and the three is after you overdose. A one and three are easy. In stage one, you try to get, keep people from being addicted, and that's non-controversial. Let's keep people from being addicted. Step three, you give them naloxone, the bring them back from the dead, also non-controversial. The problem is step two. So according to SAMHSA, we got 104,000 Mississippians that are non-medical users of you know, painkillers. One in the Department of Health would say, I don't know, 100, 200,000 people. These stage two people are addicted to opioids. They are addicted to opioids, and the question is what's gonna happen to them when we cut off their supply. So two of the recommendations are drug testing, urine testing or whatever, and prescription drug monitoring programs. Those two recommendations obviously no effect on once you've already overdosed, that's its own thing. And they will also have no effect on stage one because these people are gonna come up clean on any PDMP check, and they're also gonna come up clean on a urine screen because these people are not addicted to anything. Which is still having a real hard Okay, I'm sorry. We're four hours into this. I'm Forget that. Slow down. So, so urine checking and a PDMP will have no effect on stage one and three. The only effect they will have is addicted people who are going to fail a urine screen and are also going to show up in a PDMP as doctor shopping, too much prescriptions, whatever. Now these people are going to get cut off. Now I, I talked to a former drug addict and I said, you know, I said, look, when I've talked to people, I've said, you know, if you get cut off at 10 o'clock in the morning, you walk into your doctor and realize for the first time, we're going to check PDMPs and every doctor you walk into is going to tell you no. I said, I'm assuming by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to be on street drugs. And this person started laughing. They were like, 4 o'clock? You think it's going to take me that long? They are like, when I walk in at 10 o'clock, I'm starting to experience withdrawal symptoms. If I find out that I don't have a legal supply of something that's going to make those withdrawal symptoms go away, it's not going to be but 11 o'clock. It's going to be within the hour my entire day will become fixated on how do I solve my withdrawal problem because my legal supply of whatever it was just ran out today. And so they're going to do two things. They're going to switch to street drugs and they're going to switch to injection drug use instead of whatever route of administration. And they're going to start dying. So if you look at the handout, on that sheet, the red line is prescribing rates per 100 people and the green line is overdoses from opioids. Now you'll see they basically tracked together until 2010. 2010 was the very first time in America that we prescribed less opioids, which is the year 2011. So 2010 was the first peak, came down in 2011. Also the first year that opioid overdose rates spiked up. The next year prescriptions effectively went flat, overdoses went flat. The next year prescriptions went down at the same time as overdoses went up. So I thought this was interesting. I stuck it in Microsoft Excel and asked me how I'd ask Excel, how closely correlated from 2010 forward are the decrease in opioid to the increase in overdoses? Not point, a negative 0.99. There is a negative 0.99 correlation between the decrease in opioids and the increase in over, overall opioid deaths. You can't find that correlation to anything else, not the reformulation of OxyContin, not anything else. You find it when stage two people run out of their legal supply and they have no safety net to catch them. So the question is, what are the safety nets? Well, there's two of them. One is the doctor having flexibility to say, I checked the PDMP, you got a problem we need to talk about. You got a problem we need to deal with over the coming weeks, months, years, whatever. We don't have that. According to regulations, you are not allowed to prescribe opioids for maintenance, treatment, or detoxification. All you're allowed to prescribe is up to three days, one day at a time, while you get them into treatment. Well, treatment, we have some, some wonderful treatment providers, but the, as a state as a whole, they're almost non-existent as far as enough buprenorphine and suboxone and methadone clinics. They, they, I mean, there's almost none. So all these people in stage two, more than 100,000 of them, are about to be pushed off a cliff and we have virtually no safety net. 
Some of them will just stop. Some of them will, will go through detox, withdrawal. They'll just stop. A bunch of them won't. A bunch of them are going to die. So I went and looked at the national data, and if you look at the 50 states and line up the year that their opioid prescribing peaked or the last year before they, they cut off their prescriptions, on average, overdose deaths are, are falling, are flat to falling the year or two before the very first year they turned off supply. The year they turn off supply, overdose deaths rates spike from that year forward, just climb, 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 climb. So I went and looked at Mississippi data. If you look at Mississippi data, oh, uh, and after this spike with this correlation, for every 1% decrease in prescriptions you have, you have a 3.7% increase in opioids. Oh, I'll come back to that number. So um, same old truth in the top 10 states, same old truth for whatever. So in Mississippi, opioid deaths of any type of opioid, prescription and street drugs, was down in 09 and down in 2010, which were the last two years we had a consistent rise in prescriptions. The very first year that we uh, decreased uh, was 2011. So we, we did not have an opioid overdose problem. Our trending was down until we turned off the supply. Uh, it peaked in 20, our prescribing peaked in uh, 2011, and then it's been, uh, I'm sorry, 2012, and it's been down ever since. Three of the four years leading up to 2012, we had decreases in the death rate decreases in the death rate, we did not have a problem, and states in general don't have a problem, until you turn off the supply in stage two, where doctors do not have the flexibility to wean the person off in some, some way, shape, or form, or we don't have medication-assisted treatment of uh, buprenorphine or methadone or whatever uh, to catch these people. So without that safety net, when, you, when the people go off the cliff, a lot are gonna die, and the, the death rate just rises and rises and rises. Um, a couple of more points I wanted to make on that was the, um, if you look at it, the other chart, if you flip to the last page of the four, shows death rates for prescriptions versus heroin and fentanyl. And what you see is when prescription opioids were curved, on average over the next three to four years, on prescription overdose rates alone, we saved one person per every 100,000, fewer people. So fewer prescriptions meant fewer people died on prescriptions. But heroin and fentanyl, which had essentially been an unchanged trend line up to 2010, took off the exact year that opioid prescribing came down. And if those two trend lines had continued, then today what, what ended up happening was one fewer pe person is overdosing on, uh, on, on prescription drugs, but, but four more people are over overdosing on fentanyl and heroin. So it's true that the people are not d overdosing at the same rate on prescription drugs, but they're overdosing at four times that rate on heroin and fentanyl. So we essentially traded one death on prescription drugs for four deaths on heroin and fentanyl because there is not a way, because doctors don't, don't have the flexibility to keep people from going to the street, and we don't have medication assistance uh, treatment and therapy in large enough quantities to keep people from going to the street. So they're going to the street. They are going to the street, and the 104,000 people that are non-medical users of, uh, of painkillers in this city, as soon as they have to get a drug screen and a PDMP check every time they walk in the door, those doctors by 734311 are required to cut them off within three days. Within three days, they must have deceased prescribing of opioids to that person. And so then they're going to go, and if there's not a wait list, I mean, the problem is there's wait lists. And the question is, the wait list is always longer than however long it takes for the, 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 uh, your uh, symptoms to kick in. And then they're going to get a prescription for Suboxone, which if there's not supply on hand, their insurance company is going to tell them there's a two to four week pre-approval process. I mean, they're in, a, they're in, they're in, uh, they're in uh, withdrawals. I mean, these people are in withdrawal. They're not waiting two to four weeks. All right, one minute left. Um, so the last point I would make is, it is our choice whether we become a West Virginia or not. That, that is a choice a state makes. When you go back through all 50 states, you can look and you can say, they got where they have for a reason. They got it because at some point, without a safety net, they turned off supply. And that would, they wouldn't be where they are. Um, if you want to be West Virginia, you pull down prescriptions by about 30% over the course of five years. Bam, here you are, West Virginia, number one in death rates. That's what you do. You cut off people. You cut them off hard without a safety net in place. Um, so uh, the, the correlation is so close that I've, I've even took the liberty in here of predicting what CDC's death rates will be when they come out next month. Um, because I could have predicted that within 2% for 2014 and 2015, 
So I took the liberty of guessing for 2016, which we won't know till next month. But it correlates with a negative 0.99 correlation. You can guess the number of deaths. So the question is, how many of these people do we want to die? Right? Each page in here represents worth 1,000 people. How many of these people are going to be cut off without a safety net? That's what our death rate is going to be. And then we can make it whatever we want. Thank you all so much.